Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural episode of Sullivan and Cromwell's Trading and Markets podcast. I am Ryan Miller, your humble host. I am partner at Sullivan and Cromwell and co-head of our Commodities Futures and Derivatives Group. We couldn't be more excited to kick off this podcast as one more way for us to connect with our clients in the broader trading and markets community. I'm even more excited to begin this series today with my guest and co-host, Jamie McDonald. Many of you will know or will have seen that Jamie joined Sullivan and Cromwell as a partner effective beginning this January. He's in the building. And he most recently served before coming to SNC as the director of the CFTC's Division of Enforcement for a term of more than three years. We will jump into a Q&A with Jamie, and I'm excited to do that, mostly to look at where he sees the legal and regulatory environment going over the next year. First, before we jump into the conversation with Jamie, just a bit of background on what we think the podcast can be and what our goals are here. One thing we really want to do in our stated mission is to offer regular commentary, observations, and updates on various legal and regulatory developments for the trading and markets industry. We're going to focus on derivatives, securities, and commodities, including cryptocurrencies. We're going to jump around a bit any given episode, depending on what we're seeing in the market and where regulators are, and we will aim to do just that. With that, today, Jamie and I are going to try to capture some of what we think will be the CFTC's priorities and focus over the coming year. It's a broad and daunting task to cover in 10 minutes, but we certainly have the right person to do it, so let's jump in. Jamie, you've now worked at Sullivan and Cromwell for almost two full weeks, an illustrious and accomplished tenure, no doubt. So we fully expect you to have the answer to all of life's questions, but let's start with the easy one. Tell us a bit about the highlights of your recent time at the CFTC. What were you most proud of in terms of what the enforcement division was able to accomplish, et cetera? Thanks, Ryan. So I'm really happy to be here with you. And look, I'm really proud of what the division was able to accomplish at the CFTC over the last three and a half years. It's tough to narrow the list down, but let me try by offering three takeaways that I think were particularly meaningful over the past several years. The first really relates to the markets, broadly speaking. You just can't walk out of the CFTC without having a deep appreciation, really the essential role that the commodity and derivatives markets play in our economy and in our lives. Whether you're talking about ensuring the stability of prices, economic growth, the free flow of capital and access to capital, or the ability to mitigate business risk. Each of these requires well-functioning commodities and derivatives markets. And so first, I'm really proud of the work that the division did as part of the agency more broadly. It really does extend beyond just enforcement. And I think this is an important point to think about at the outset. When you're talking about enforcement, uh, you really got to remember that enforcement isn't the goal in itself. It's a tool to advance the agency's overall mission to preserve the integrity of these markets and to protect market participants. And I was happy that enforcement was able to play a part in that. So that, that's number one. Number two relates to the work that the division did. I'm particularly proud of the work that the division did over the last several years to increase the transparency and ultimately, I think, the fairness in the way that the division went about its work. The division took I really think unprecedented steps to create new policies and guidance for the division, and then to publish that guidance so that folks on the outside could have access to them. The goal, as I mentioned just a minute ago, isn't just to bring enforcement actions for the sake of bringing them. It's to deter misconduct before it happens. It's to give businesses the tools that they need so that they can build their compliance programs and their surveillance systems in, in the right way. So the agency took a number of really extraordinary strides in this regard. The Division of Enforcement issued its first enforcement manual, which laid out the policies and procedures that guide division staff, and it made the manual public. It issued its first ever civil monetary penalty guidance, setting out the factors the division would consider in arriving at its penalty recommendations. I think in the penalty guidance in particular, there's a lot that's notable there. But one particular point that I think is worth just pausing on for a second is that the division said for the first time expressly that it would consider the penalties imposed by other enforcement authorities and related actions, such as the Department of Justice or the SEC. I think the people do expect that their government would speak with one voice, and it's fair to expect that they'd be coordinating with one another when addressing conduct that stretches across the jurisdiction of multiple agencies. And this was the first time that the division had expressly and publicly said that it was going to consider those sorts of things when determining the appropriate penalty. 
The division also issued its first ever compliance guidance, setting out the sorts of things that it would consider when evaluating the adequacy and effectiveness of a corporate compliance program, issued guidance on corporate and individual cooperation about how it would think about foreign corrupt conduct that might violate CFTC rules, and it published annual reports at the end of the past three fiscal years, laying out the priorities and explaining how the actions that it brought furthered those priorities. So I'm proud of the particular cases that the agency brought, but I'm especially proud of this commitment, this underlying commitment to fairness and transparency that manifested itself in all of these public statements and guidances that came out of the agency. And the last point, I know I'm this is a bit of a long answer, but there's there's a lot to be proud of, I think. No, please, uh, please. Uh, the, the stage is yours. The, the, this third point relates to the staff and the people at the agency. And this really may be the most important point, even more than the particular pieces of work. I'm proud of the commission and the commission staff that did the work, showing really, I think, true dedication and professionalism. The commissioners and the agency staff, like everyone else in the country and the world, carried out this critically important work in the midst of this unprecedented COVID pandemic. The people at the agency did the work really without missing a beat, all while navigating the obstacles, issues, and anxieties that came along with the pandemic. This, I really think, was extraordinary. It was a tremendous reflection on all of them. And being part of that staff response, this double-down commitment to get the job done during the pandemic, really will be a point of pride that I'll carry with me for the rest of my career. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. And I can say from this side of the room, I mean, we absolutely saw your staff and the teams there entirely mission focused over the year. And you're right, there was not a delay in terms of their ability to pursue investigations. And I'm sure we'll see that continued effort going forward. Looking now, I guess, forward a little bit, a similar question, but a slightly different perspective. We're obviously tremendously excited to have you now on the Sullivan and Cromwell team, the firm more broadly, and many of our clients have been really enthusiastic about having you on board. Sort of an announcement for anyone listening, always happy to set up those discussions and meetings. For you, Jamie, what was your thought process as you looked at transition out of the agency, a fairly long tenure in terms of that role of enforcement director and, and coming to Sullivan and Cromwell? And more directly, what goals and priorities do you have in mind as for the practice here? Yeah, so I really didn't give any thought to next steps until after I had left the agency at the end of the last fiscal year. But when I did start to think seriously about it, I was drawn to S&C for several reasons. It's not enough to say, well, we've got an expert in commodities work or derivatives work or investigations or enforcement or whatever it might be. You really do need an interdisciplinary group who can together truly serve as counselors to the clients so that you're not just addressing any particular narrow issue, which could, by the way, turn out to be the smaller part of a bigger issue. I think in order to really address these sorts of complex and complicated issues, you have to be able to identify and understand all the different pieces, and you have to be able to look at them from a broader perspective and fit them together. And that's really not something I think that any single person can do. It takes a team ranging across different practice areas. I hope that going forward, drawing on my experience running enforcement at the CFTC, I might be able to help the team advise the firm's current and future clients, help them navigate any issues or obstacles they may face in investigations, but also to help them continue to build out and refine their own internal compliance and surveillance systems. So they might be able to avoid these sorts of issues going forward, the kinds of things that might lead to regulatory investigations in the first place. Yeah, that's great insight and perspective. And so again, thrilled to have you on the team and, and I know many of our clients are as well. So now the $100 million question, and, and as much as practical, let's stay focused on a trading and markets community. Where do you see enforcement and investigation themes going in the next six or 12 months, whether that's CFTC, DOJ, or otherwise? So I think like so many things here, the details are going to be important. And I think actually before we can think about what's going to change. I think it's useful to identify the things that actually won't change. And I think there are a few of them that'll be important going forward. The one is probably an obvious point, but worth mentioning and and worth starting with. The staff by and large won't change. The staff is a career staff. Most have been at the agency across multiple administrations. They're going to approach the job in the same way with the same professionalism and dedication 
on January 21st of this year that they did on the same day four years before and that they did on the same day four years before that. The second thing is that the length of time that investigations take runs into multiple years. It can take in the ballpark of two years for investigations to run their course. That means that the cases that you see today are the product of investigative decisions that have been made at various points over the last couple of years. And the third point here is the, it relates to the priorities of the agency. If you look back at the last several annual reports for the Division of Enforcement, the division's priorities really didn't change year over year. And in the first annual report, the division noted that the priorities that it was identifying there were largely the same as the prior administration. And so I expect that the priorities will largely stay the same going forward. But of course, there's also going to be change. And I think there will be some meaningful change in meaningful areas. There'll be a new chairman. I think the new chairman is likely to bring in a new director of enforcement as well as potentially other new directors for the policy divisions. The chair and any new director of enforcement will want to bring their own views into the agency. They'll want to put their own stamps on the enforcement program. So this really is where your $100 million question will play out. Where are these areas going to be? You might look to some of the areas where there have been policy differences or policy debates in the past, so areas relating to corporate penalties or what types of issues should be handled as compliance issues in the policy divisions versus which types of issues should be referred over to enforcement. How should the Division of Enforcement or the Commission think about minor violations? Are they merely minor violations that could warrant a closing letter or a declination, or should they be used as examples? Punishing small violations aggressively can deter bigger violations, might be the theory. There are other areas newer to the CFTC space, like ESG-related issues, whether you're talking about climate change or some other component. Of course, we saw through the Market Risk Advisory Committee a report on ESG-related issues, and it'll be interesting to see whether that carries over into the next administration. The point here, I think, is that there are real policy issues that are either have been debated over the past few years, where there have been differences among different commissioners or issues that are just sort of still developing that I think the agency is going to continue to work through in the years ahead. And I think these will come up in the context of all of the different areas that the CFC regulates, whether you're talking about trading activity or swap dealer regulation and oversight or intermediaries. Uh, or things like digital assets or physical commodities, spaces that I think the agency has been a little more active in in recent time. I think you're going to see these debates and differences play out. And I do think that you'll see meaningful policy differences that will manifest themselves in meaningful differences in, a, in enforcement approaches. And I think it'll, it'll be really interesting to follow. Well, thanks so much, Jamie. R really terrific insight. And thank you for making the time to come on and do this. Obviously, look forward to working with you for many years. We're going to wrap up this session here. Thank you to everyone who listened. As always, if there are questions, comments, or even suggestions on anything we covered today or anything trading and markets related, please feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Jamie. We're happy to pick up the discussion. Until next time, stay safe, everyone, and thanks again for listening.